This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library, Main Branch, and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Hey, everybody. This is Razib Khan, and I am here with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And today I have a very special guest, and we're going to be talking about something that I think a lot of you have heard about recently. Uh, Normally, I don't try to talk about things that are, quote, in the news, but this is such a big deal that I I wanted to do a podcast about it. It's about the two new homo finds that, um, you know, one in China, the Dragon Man, uh, Homo Longi, or possibly Homo Daliensis, and uh, I'll mention why I'm a little... um, clarify that issue there and then also there's a new homo possibly in israel uh i think it's at the site called nesha ramla i think they want to call it homo ramla but like they didn't get i don't know who gets to decide these sorts of things they didn't get the approval and so they're just saying it's kind of like a neanderthal it has modern human uh technology or the tech, same technology as modern humans so uh, i'm here with uh vagish and he is a geneticist uh he is a genomics guy you know he You know him if you're a listener of my uh, podcast on ancient India and all that stuff. But, I mean, he's a general genomics guy, human evolutionary genomics guy. And he has some opinions. I have some opinions. And, you know, I wrote a Substack post uh, kind of outlining where I felt the science was. But in this conversation, I think uh, I want to extend it a little bit, dig deep into it, and um, just kind of explore, like, what conclusions geneticists might draw from these results, which are going to be somewhat different from the paleoanthropologists who are pretty much front and center in these two papers. So, Vagish, could you just uh, tell tell the listeners who you are? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me, Razib. And uh, also great to see you in Austin. And we're in Austin at the moment. Um, I am a assistant professor of integrative biology and statistics and data sciences at UT Austin. And uh, our laboratory works on human evolutionary genomics, uh, both on um, the ancient DNA side, but also looking at the genetic basis of various medically relevant traits. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm going to do a quick overview of what's going on here uh, in terms of these papers and then um, kind of present my perspective. And then, Vagish, like, let me let, let you go because uh, you got some opinions too. Uh, so these papers, uh, it, it, I don't know if it's coincidental, but both of these fossils seem to date to about the same period, although it's a big interval. Um, you know, the Longi is on the order of like, you know, probably no no younger than 140,000. And then the Nesha, I think, is 120,000, mm-hmm. the Nesha Ramla. And so they're about the same time period, which is before the massive out-of-Africa expansion that we know, uh, I think the Upper Paleolithic technology, if you're a, a bones archaeology person. But it is after the emergence of modern humans, anatomically modern humans. So the first, for sure, anatomically modern human is obviously is the 200,000 year, um, you know, find in Ethiopia. But there are proto-modern human uh, fossils uh, in Jebel Hood in Morocco, which could be like between three to 400,000 years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, modern humans, they're around at this period, but these are not modern humans. Um, So... Well, maybe they're not modern humans. This is, we'll actually get into this. So the Nesha Ramla uh, hominin, uh, it seems to me that it's related to or it's a form of Neanderthal. It's part of the Neanderthal clade. We don't know because we don't have ancient DNA, which is unfortunate. And we'll get into why that's a problem. Um, but its technology is very similar to modern humans at the time. And so I think the big takeaway from that find is, oh, well, all these hominin groups, all these human groups uh, – they have very similar technology, and you can't like, tell them apart from archaeology. You can only tell them apart from phenotype, morphology, or ancient DNA if we had it. Longi is similar um, to the Nesha Ramla in terms of a robust individual. You know, they call it Dragon Man, um, and you know, it was discovered in Har- around Harbin. It was in a bridge in Manchuria, so it's pretty far north, and um, so it's pretty far north, and they claim that its morphology uh, puts it in 
nested in a lineage with modern humans. So it's a it's a, it's a taxa lineage. So the term modern human is kind of confusing because you know most of us are descended from archaics and moderns. So I'm going to use the term we use stem human, okay? Just because stem human means like that's most of the modern ancestry. Um, it's a sister lineage to Neanderthals and Denisovans, probably in Africa, perhaps not. We can get into that. Um, what they found through phylogenetic analysis of the characters on the skull, and the skull is an excellent skull apparently, uh, is that this individual actually nested in with our own modern human lineage and not with Neanderthals. So Neanderthals are the outgroup. And so they concluded, oh, well, this is related to modern humans. Homo longi is the closest to modern humans of all these ancient populations. I think that's wrong. Okay, just simply I think it's wrong. I think the issue here is you can't draw these conclusions just on morphology. If morphology is all you had, fine. But, you know, we have a lot of ancient DNA to scaffold our expectations and our priors. This individual at this time period with this sort of morphology, with the robustness of the teeth, I think this individual is almost certainly one of the uh, populations that we call Denisovan. Uh, a lot of people think this, but we can't confirm it without ancient DNA because aside from, I think, uh, um, the teeth in Tibet uh, that were you know published on in 2019, there hasn't been a really uh, clear DNA identification of uh, a morphological specimen that's Denisovan. So Denisovan's our population we know really well, pretty well genomically, and we know that Denisovan ancestry is present in Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea and East and South Asia. But, um, you know, we don't have a, a, a skull skull or skeleton to attach to it. And then we have these skeletons and skulls like Homo longi in East Asia, but we don't really have a good sense of where we place them in the human phylogeny, partly because there's been a lot less stuff going on mm -hmm. in East Asia until recently. Um, we don't have the same tradition that we had in Europe. I think the Neanderthals, the comparison with Neanderthals is misleading because Neanderthals are a population that seems to have gone through many bottlenecks over and over again. They tend to be really homogenous. I think they're extremely well adapted to North Eurasian climatic regimes, while Denisovans, I believe, uh, had a larger effective population across their whole range, even though the Siberian ones were that we have genomes from, from Denisova Cave, had a small population. It looks like the Denisovans had a lot of deep divergences. And I think East and Southeast Asia as a whole is prime hominin habitat. So I think there was a lot of lot of uh, depth uh, for Ice Age refugia when it got cold and dry. Whereas with the Neanderthals, I think they came close to extinction over and over again. And this explains why Neanderthals are just so distinct and striking in their adaptations and their genetic homogeneity. Whereas the stem humans, the Neo-Africans from one to 300,000 years ago, as well as the Denisovans are much more diverse in, I think, their morphology. And also they probably had a larger effective population size, but we can't know for sure uh, without... Um, you know, an ancient modern genome, which actually, like, I don't think we've had yet, partly just because of probably the climate. So I've been talking for a while. Vagish, like, you jump in and tell me what you yeah, think. Yeah, so I think you're hitting all the right points, Razib. So I think there's several important things, distinctions to make here. So the first thing is, when we were talking about modern humans in these cases, we're talking about anatomically modern humans. So samples that fall within sort of uh, a PCA analysis of landmark of landmark or semi-landmarks done on the morphology of the sample. So and a second important piece of the puzzle is that no one really knows what a Denisovan looks like yet. Um, we have a genome of a Denisovan, but it's a mysterious thing that we have a genome but don't have morphology for a particular species. And the Denisovan is one of the few species that is like that. But we know the, as you said, the geographic range that could have been occupied by these Denisovans in the past. We have one from Denis, a sample from Denisova Cave. We have a mandible from Tibet that was identified as Denisovan based on a single amino acid substitution um, at the protein level. So, you know, while that's an analysis that sort of places the sample as a Denisovan, I think, you know, it's just a single amino acid substitution that could have occurred for any number of reasons, placing it in the Denisovan lineage. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to, you know, while the evidence is suggestive that it's Denisovan, I think we still, you know, we need more more research to sort of think about whether that really is a Denisovan or not and so on. And, of course, we have Denisovan ancestry in present-day people of Australia and Aboriginal people of Australia and Papua New Guinea. And so we have this huge ge geographic range that could have been possibly occupied by Denisovans. Uh, and so, 
without ancient DNA, I think I think the real question is where is the DNA data for these for for this particular sample, and what that would say about which lineage mm-hmm. if we're talking about that that this sample would lie in. Well, so you you come out of uh, David Reich's group uh, before you were an assistant professor here at UT. Um, l- let me ask you about ancient DNA because I I tried to look at the articles. Frankly, I looked at the Wikipedia entry because Wikipedia entries often have like really good citations of the latest stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no evidence or no um, – they didn't say that they even looked for ancient DNA. And so this is an old fossil. It's 140,000 years old. I'm not – I mean it was well preserved. But So with ancient DNA, you're looking for the teeth and you're looking for the hyoid bone, right? That's right. Okay. Can um, you tell? Can you tell them what the hyoid bone is? Yeah. So it's, it's uh, it, or also sometimes uh, referred to the petrous bone. And this is a bone inside the uh, inner skull cavity, um, and it's largely used for ancient DNA because based on empirical evidence of the various parts of the body that contain DNA, it's thought to be the skeletal element that preserves DNA the best over long time scales. And this has empirically been seen in by evidence from sequencing large numbers of samples, although the scientific reasons why that it's the best bone to use isn't quite clear. There are many hypotheses, one of them possibly that it's protected from the environment in a way that other bones are not. Um, the second could be that it's a very dense bone, but and by density, I mean cellular density. And higher number of cells means higher number of nuclei in them, and higher number of nuclei mean higher concentration of DNA molecules that could possibly be left. Um, and so it's quite unclear why that's the type of bone but uh, th- that's most likely to yield ancient DNA data. But again, there's no indication that that type of analysis has been done on this sample as yeah. of now. Well, I mean, so I guess I don't know. Well, I actually do know Chris Stringer, who was the last author. I, I, I could have asked Chris, but um, you know, he was brought in. So I said explicitly, I'll say it on my side. I, I said on my sub stack that I was a little suspicious. Uh, and, you know, Vagish is not saying this, but uh, I was a little suspicious that, um, you know, they were trying to say that, oh, well, this is a modern human based on the phylo or this is the closest to modern humans based on the phylogenetic analysis. And the media spin now is, oh, this totally revolution is revolutionizes our <laughs> understanding of the origin of modern humans because now there's a modern human like lineage. And, um, you know, I said in my sub stack, like, I just wonder if the Chinese scientists because I don't think the Chinese scientists themselves um like, let's just say I don't think that they have as strong ideological priors as some of their paymasters, to be entirely frank. And so I think, okay, well, maybe they were pressured into claiming that this was a modern based on this phylogenetic analysis. Like, it's all speculation. Chris says that that's not true at all and that they brought him in um, in preference to someone who was more of a multi-regionalist, you know, more of a local developmental person. So I don't know what's going on there. It's just really strange to me. Uh, that they would make a strong claim like this on phylogenetic influence I on totally, characters. I totally okay? agree. I, I think that, you know, first of all, it's a single sample. So who is to say that if you sampled many more individuals from this population, that this is just an extreme end of that population, and actually the two populations don't overlap at all? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, this is just a single sample that's sort of on the edge and appears to be in a clade with respect to, or, or you know, on the on the phylogenetic analysis to be on the modern human side rather than the Neanderthal side. Um, and, and second, I think that morphology alone may not be informative about the lineage of the sample because who is to say that a Denisovan doesn't have that particular skeletal morpho- yeah. morphology? Yeah. I think we don't know. And until we link DNA to a skull that surely is a Denisovan, we have no way to know. And yeah. maybe Denisovans and modern anatomically modern humans overlap a lot compared yeah. to Neanderthals in their morphology. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the stylized facts, and like John Hawks, actually, my friend John Hawks, uh, I will say he's my friend, but because we are, um, he's been on this podcast before. Uh, you know, he pointed out exactly what Vagish said that, you know, we have one sample, we don't have it in the context of all the other, you know, a, a reasonable sampling 
of individuals from this population, the population distribution. One of the issues that always happens um, in the study of human origins and human evolution is there are people who are convinced that there are Neanderthals who walk amongst us, like someone who's a grocery <laughs> store clerk, you know, someone who works like, you know, he's a taxi driver. And, you know, every scientist talks about the fact that they get emails from people who are just like, you need to test this person. Uh, I'm 100% convinced that they are a Neanderthal. Well, part of the issue here is modern humans vary in appearance. And we have this idea that ancient that our ancient ancestors or, you know, our sister, the sister lineages to our stem sapiens lineage uh, have like some archetypical look. But we don't necessarily know if that's true. Like, yes, on average, Neanderthals are more robust while our own lineage is pretty grassle. But these are averages. And there are humans uh, in the modern uh, just that are modern humans who are pretty robust. So Australian Aborigines, for example, are known to have like robust skulls. And I think a straightforward explanation for that is they never settled down with agriculture. It seems agricultural populations, like our mutual friend Ian Matheson, you know, is always telling me like, oh, the you know, agriculturalists have like their skull, their skulls and their skeletons are just wimpy. Like, That's right. Environment has a huge impact on skeletal morphology. You know, classic overbite, for example, is largely a result of cultural change before and after the agricultural revolution. And so, you know, that's something that's been seen in the skeletal record, even though there's very little genetic change over this period. Um, and so that's an example where you see this sort of thing. I think I also want to draw two other ex cases where you see some of this sort of distinction between DNA and morphology. One is the so-called Homo heidelbergensis specimen uh, from Atapuerca Cave, Um at around 650,000 years, I believe. Yeah. And uh, so for a long time, morpho people looked at its morphology and sort of placed it on a lineage and even assigned it a, a homo subcategory, mm -hmm. homo heidelberg heidelberg heidelbergensis. Uh, but then ancient DNA sequencing, which is sort of the world record, at least for a hominid sample, uh, actually places that sample on the early Neanderthal lineage. Yeah. So there's a classic example where even when we know morphology and DNA are connected, yeah. the changes just haven't taken place at that particular time in that particular population mm -hmm. for the morphology to be associated with a particular lineage in the anatomy. But it's clear based on the DNA where it lies in the broad human phylogeny. Um, yeah, let me um, let me ask you something, Navagish, because yeah, sure. I think people are going to be curious about this disjunction so we're saying there's one homo longi okay um that's one individual i think they said they have is it like 600 characters so they put 600 characters into the phylogenetic analysis right mm -hmm. and so you're saying oh it's one individual we can't draw too many inferences on the other hand people say that all the time about whole genome sequences like oh you have like one whole genome sequence how can you draw inferences about you know, such robust, or you think it's robust, you know? Right. And I, I think I know what you're going to say, but yeah. like, why don't you say it? Like, why don't you explain it? Sure. I, I think there's two layers of distinction. I think one with landmark and semi-landmark analysis, you sort of have to make decisions, like human subjective decisions about what those landmarks are and like how you're computing them and so on. With the genome, it sort of arrives from nature uh, and, and you're stuck with that. Second of all, I think the... Uh, DNA data has information of multiple independent blocks because they're inherited from different ancestors. And so uh, having a million or a billion positions of DNA actually is informative, not just about that one sample, but a range of that person's ancestors. So taken together, and, and, and third, the morphology of a sample could be driven by a small number of var variants that might have very large effect and cause particular types of phenotypic change, but doesn't necessarily have to reflect long or broad changes across uh, across DNA. Yeah. So I think taken together, all three types of reasons basically suggest that somehow, at least in my mind, with with due respect to paleoanthropologists, that like the DNA evidence it, it sort of has a richer picture of sort yeah. of the phylogenetic relationship of these various samples yeah let's let, let, let's talk concrete numbers because people like numbers just like they like to know the or they used to like to know how fast their their chip their, their chip and their computer was 
Um, you know, we have 3 billion base pairs, like what the average human has, like 100 million or so polymorphism difference from the reference, you know, 10 million or so common polymorphisms. These are a lot of input variables uh, to make an inference off of. This skull was really, really good in terms of its quality. That's they right. Got, they got 600 characters. That's right. So imagine 600 snips. Okay, <laughs> what can you do with six? You could do you could do some stuff with six hundred snips. Like That's twenty right. years ago, six hundred snips was, was a decent. lot. Yeah. And it also depends on how diverged two samples are, two species yeah. are, because six hundred snips may be a lot if you're looking at comparing, say, humans with a macaque or something like that. But maybe if you're looking at populations that just diverged very recently, six hundred snips might not be enough. Yeah. Um in fact, like that going back to that Denisovan mandible or, or putative Denisovan mandible, it was distinguished from between humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans by a single amino acid substitution. Yeah. So we we're talking about that level of resolution. Yeah, which here. and you were straight up front about it, so it's not like you have a double standard here, right? You know, I mean, it's like that's and that that was brought up by evolutionary geneticists at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably um, just for the listener, you know, this this work in proteins, this is going to be a big deal because proteins are much more robust totally than DNA. Totally agree. And so, like, when it comes to like species identification, I mean, I think they're going to go back millions of years. I also think so, and and I think in general, like. Paleoproteomic and ancient DNA analysis should sort of be a must in the publication of these papers or reporting of the science of these papers, or at least their attempts. Yeah. Um, and, and and I think this should be true, not just for this Homo longi sample, but also for samples like Homo naledi, uh, which was also a spectacular discovery. And, you know, of course, is sort of uh, anthropologically and morphometrically very different mm -hmm. uh, from modern humans and Neanderthals and so on. Yeah. But... Uh, it would be nice to see attempts of ancient DNA or reports, at least, of attempted ancient DNA and uh, paleoproteomic analyses on those samples. Uh, mm -hmm. And this also holds for sort of the South Southeast Asian hominid remains that have been out there yeah. uh, over the past decade or so. Yeah, let's let's do a, let me let me do a review of some of this stuff because uh, I think it's like second nature for uh, some listeners, but um, you know some people might not know the alphabet soup or it's not an alphabet soup, but it's just like it's a menagerie of hominids. It's mm -hmm. like you know it's reigning human species, it right? Is. Yep. So we got we got Naledi probably last until at least two hundred thousand years ago, which means that it overlapped with moderns. Um, that's a little coincidental because that's about when moderns you know Very show up in the so. area. You know it's all, right. it's always a coincidence. Um, so we got Naledi. That's based on a bunch of fossils mm -hmm. like they have a bunch of fossils there this is a small brained small hominid not quite a pygmy but definitely short okay i'm um, kind of a primitive i don't want to say primitive like I i'm going to get into the primitive versus drive thing because i think we need to clarify this and if you listen to my podcast with chris stringer he talked about this extensively um this is an area where you know paleoanthropologists have gotten much better and have a little to teach the rest of us uh and then in southeast asia it's like incredibly speciose. Like I need to do a podcast at some point just about Southeast Asia, absolutely, because it's just crazy. So let's 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 take it off. We got the Flores hobbits. Like those are almost certainly a real lineage. We got Homo lizenzensis now in Luzon. Okay, and that's that's a, right. that's a separate one. Um, there's a lot of inference, inferential data now that just like points to the likelihood there must have been Denisovans in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So that's like number three. Um, it could be that the Denisovans. Um, that mixed with the Negritos of the Philippines are different from the Denisovans that mixed with the <laughs> with the Australians. Yeah, with the Papua Papuas. New Guinea. So it could be two Denisovan lineages. There are late quote Homo erectus, which is probably just some sort of derived uh, that hasn't been like very well classified, right? That's right. And so we could get to like around five or six now. Uh, the final thing is, and I want to talk to you about this, Vagish, because this is an, uh, a discussion that I have had with uh, I think your former mentor uh, Nick Patterson. Um, I've discussed this. There are there is evidence of modern human lineages in East and Southeast Asia um, before our current experience. So the current out of Africa that's right expansion I, is sixty thousand years ago. Yes, but I mean we have to think about the the dates uh, associated with those lineages and or assemblages in some cases. Uh, and and I, I assume you're referring to the samples or. The, the cultural evidence in Australia and Sumatra. Yeah, with Sumatra like in early... particular. Australia, I'm a little skeptical about. Fair. Uh, I, I think I, I'm sort of in the same yeah. boat as you, and perhaps a lot of people maybe. But uh, you're, you're right. And so another question to ask is that maybe, you know, you have an initial out of Africa event, 
followed by a second one in which the second one wipes out the first one. Yeah. And so how do you place... I think the big question is that we understand some evidence about population history or, or hominid history from the DNA and some evidence from anatomical evidence and, and cultural assemblage evidence. But the big question is how do you integrate the two and try and figure out what is what? So who is to know that whether Homo floresiensis or Luzonensis was the Denisovan that contributed ancestry to the Negritos uh, in the Philippines? Like maybe they're the one in the same population. Um, it's hard to know and, uh, you know, possibly maybe it's too different anatomically to make that sort of statement. But I think we'll never know until we get DNA evidence and sort of try and reconcile some of these sort of open questions that are out there. Yeah. Um, so, like, let's go back to DNA. You know, Adam Siepel and his group have discovered or claim, and other groups also in um, for the Neanderthals in the West, uh, that there was modern human admixture into the Altai Neanderthals, which dates to, like, I think 120,000 years ago or so. That's right. And so, you know, these are... I mean, we know the Neanderthals didn't go further like beyond, say, they didn't. They don't seem to have gone into Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, now there's like possible Israeli, and we'll talk about Homo, uh, Rama. Rama. Yeah, but uh, but so, are you confident that that's a that is a correct inference? So you know, th- there was multiple papers that sort of looked at this sort of analysis, and there was also the Coolwilm et al. paper, I think Nature 2016 mm-hmm. or 17, that sort of discussed this. Um, and so initially, you know, th- th- both of those types of analysis use very complicated statistical processes that have several assumptions built into them. And, you know, if we assume those assumptions are right, then, you know, we can, we could believe those, uh, inferences. But I think there's a stronger piece of evidence that suggests this, which is the replacement of the mitochondrial DNA of uh, Neanderthals. So if you build a phylogenetic relationship of the whole genomes of Neanderthals, humans, and Denisovans, it's clear broadly without invoking admixture that the majority ancestry of these various populations diverge in the following form where modern humans diverge first and then Denisovans and Neanderthals diverge from each other. However, if you look at the mitochondrial DNA of of the three species, you find that humans and Neanderthals share a common ancestor before Denisovans. So this suggests that there is some other type of relationship that's occurring. And based on mitochondrial DNA sequences of different types of Neanderthals, the uh, sort of the, the overwhelming hypothesis from that type of analysis has been that there's been a replacement in the mitochondrial DNA lineages of Neanderthals by a lineage that was closer to the modern human lineage compared to the Denisovan lineage. Yeah. So that sort of process leads to a second line of evidence suggesting that Neanderthals too might have some modern human uh, contributions to their ancestry, at least some groups of Neanderthals. Yeah. I mean, when you're saying closer, like when I looked at the the Sepal group's work and I think the earlier group, that, quote, modern admixture is like at the base of mm-hmm. the diversification of all the modern extant modern lineages that's right so it's pretty back there right and so what i'm proposing here is we can think of possibly the modern the stem sapiens that we come from mm-hmm. as like maybe some sort of tropical lineage that's in africa coastal indian ocean it could go into southeast asia periodically right and so you can have this interaction that periodically happens but um it's pretty clear from the genomic evidence and also to some extent the archaeology that there was a massive expansion around 60,000 years ago from one single stem sapiens lineage, That correct? sounds right, yeah. I, I, I'm 100% supporting like that every, statement. Yeah, everyone everyone pretty much says that looking at the data. Um, you can't... So, uh, you know, let me let me um, clarify that before we go back to our, our quote, archaic cousins. So, um, you know, the stylized fact that we had 20 years ago was there's like one tribe of Africans that just expanded and replaced everyone else. And so I feel like um, what I would say right now to update that is, okay, so for non-African populations, that definitely holds true. There's a bottlenecked population of like one to 10,000, and then it expands 60,000 years ago. And that's Mm -hmm. why all non-Africans are so genetically homogeneous, whether you're an Australian Aborigine or a Han Chinese or a Swede. 
right? That's right. Yeah. All of these like coalesce back to like 60K BP. Mm-hmm. Um, within Africa, I feel like it's a more complex model. There's divergences. Like some of these uh, hunter gatherers diverged quite early, like 200,000 years ago or so. Mm-hmm. And then um, I believe that there was some sort of back migration, but since they have very little Neanderthal, mm-hmm. it has to be perhaps earlier. So, you know, I kind of have like a more complex model in my head where there was reciprocal interactions between um, stem sapiens, between modern humans that are in like northern Africa, perhaps into Arabia with sub-Saharan African lineages south of the Sahara. And that, um, you know, in our models, we just kind of brushed that away. And I think that that explains why you get you know, what, why? So, African hunter gatherers, like the Mobutu pygmies in particular, the Eastern pygmies, mm-hmm. and then the Khoisan, um, from everything that I've seen, they are an outgroup in comparison to everybody else. And that includes West Africans and sure. East Africans, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, how do you explain this? One way you can explain it is, oh, well, the out of Africa group is just an East African or a West African, probably an East African group, right? Right. And so, but another way you can explain it is, is that there was um, migration from that out of Africa group that came back into Africa and never mixed with Neanderthals for obvious reasons. That's right. And do you think, um, I mean, am I crazy here? No, I, I think, that, you know, this story about like where that stem sapien group comes from or what geographic range it occupied, I don't think it's possible to sort of get at this. And I, there was a paper last year, a very controversial paper in Nature, trying to place the origin of that stem group of Africa, uh, stem group of humans to Southern Africa or something oh, yeah. based on the uh, awkward. Yeah. That was the mitochondria. It was mitochondrial I mean, DNA and climactic like, evidence or something. It was a like paper that. out of the, the late 1990s or something. That's right. <laughs> it was and, really strange. Right. But basically trying to do exactly this, like trying to put a, a place on where these people could have lived and like where they spread from and so on and so forth. And like, there was a lot of pushback and I think a, a, a very well reputed geneticist and anthropologists and paleo, paleoanthropologists wrote a, a response piece to that article uh, sort of really h- highlighting sort of the various technical reasons why doing something like that, you know, is yeah, maybe at least, not at least from like correct. the information they had. That's right. You can't draw such inferences. Yeah, which, uh-huh. which, which, which people tried to in the past and partly just we had a simpler model of the origin of our species. That's right. It's getting more complicated by the day. Yeah, it um, is getting more complicated by the day. So uh, let's move back to the east, uh, to the far east, so the Denisovans. So, you know, you mentioned Denisovans in Australasia. Um, but, you know, I mean, both of us have Denisovan ancestry. Right. You know, uh, there's like there's low amounts in South Asia, like on the order of 0.1 to 0.2%. Mm-hmm. You know, one of your your colleague, former colleagues from the Reich Lab, you know, uh, Siriam Sakharam has been working on that. Right. And um, in East Asia, it's like point. 0.15% Northeast Asia. And then Southeast Asia gets a little higher. higher. Especially right. as you get like more Mal- Australian Melanesian ancestry, right? That's right. And so Denisovans are all over the place. You have these Denisovan segments. You can identify them from the Denisova, Denisova cave samples, because mm-hmm. I think it's more than one now. That's right. Okay. But the issue is, you know, um, Browning, uh, Browning and Browning at University of Washington were the first ones that were noticing the patterns of the haplotypes. In the, in the, in the segments, the ones in Papua... The people in Papua have more diverged Denisovan than the people in East Asia because the people in East Asia seem to have gotten Denisovan ancestry from a lineage that was much closer to the ones in Denisova cave. That's correct. Okay. And this is important because it's very different than the model we have for Neanderthals or our own lineage stem of stem sapiens, at least outside of Africa, that expanded relatively rapidly from a small founder group. So um, another more recent paper has suggested that there is like a late admixture in in Papua and then an earlier one in Southeast Asia and a separate one in East Asia and uh, a recent paper, which I, you know, I haven't had time to, to write about this. There's some really great work out of the Philippines that came out, but basically the, the Philippine Negritos who were there before the Austronesians, they had a fairly high proportion of Denisovan, perhaps more than the Papuans. That's right. And that Denisovan looks like a different type of Denisovan. Mm-hmm. And so what I mentioned earlier is that Denisovans, um, you know, we don't have a fossil attached to them, so we don't have Homo Denisova. But like this whole group, this clade and this lineage, it can be thought of as equivalent to modern humans of basically having like different biogeographic racial groups that are very deep. I mean, some of these lineages, they're, they're saying they might have separated three to four hundred thousand years ago, which is as, as great as any modern more than any modern humans. That's exactly right. And, you know, some of these groups might. So so another interesting aspect of the Denisova genome is that it appears to have what geneticists at least call super archaic ancestry. So ancestry that 
very far diverged, like one to two million years uh, from from the other hominid lineages. So that's and and perhaps some Denisovan lineages could have that ancestry, and other Denisovan lineages might not, simply because that one group at Denisova Cave might have gotten ancestry from I that see. population group. So still, I, I think you know it's the Denisovans remain a mystery as to their geographic range, how they look like, and so on. You know, to go back to the the skull that we're talking about, dragon man or Homo longi or whatever you want to Homo call it, Homo daliensis. Yeah. And I'll mention the issue there. But um, uh, there there is a paper trying to connect DNA of Denisovans and actually Neanderthals to phenotypic characteristics. And this uses the argument that you can measure DNA methylation levels from uh, these ancient samples and the process of that the process that you can do this itself is magical. So uh, I don't know. So maybe I'll just explain it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, DNA degrades differently in methylated and unmethylated regions. So as you know, or perhaps people in this podcast might be interested to know that. Uh, different parts, even though every cell in your body has the same DNA, uh, they manifest differently. And that's why you have different cell types and your hair looks different from your eyes and so on. And this is done largely by a process called epigenetics, which regulates which genes are turned on and off uh, in different part, in different cell types. And so it's possible to infer some of these epigenetic characteristics in ancient DNA because regions that are methylated, that's an epigenetic change uh, on a, on, in DNA, degrades differently from regions that are unmethylated. So, and this differential degradation results in differential C to T substitutions on unmethylated regions compared to unmethylated regions. And you can use this as a high fidelity readout of the epigenetic mm. characteristic of the sample when, when that sample, when, when that person passed away or in this case, hominid. So uh, as a second line of evidence, there was a second line of inquiry, this paper published last year used this epigenetic information to try and predict the phenotypic characteristic of a Neanderthal or indeed a Denisovan. Mm -hmm. And first tried to do this by trying to predict the phenotypic characteristic of a Neanderthal, for which we actually know what the skeleton looks like and the skull looks like and the morphology looks like. And they show, by and large, at least qualitatively, that they were able to predict the brow ridges and the robust body types and uh, height and, I think, uh, s sort of the girth yeah, of the yeah, sample yeah. and like so on. Very barrel chested. Barrel chested. Very yeah. broad scale anatomical characteristics that we could assign qualitatively to a Neanderthal. Yeah. And so they show that largely they can make those predictions. And they employ this now to a Denisovan sample for which there is no morphology that's currently existing. And it's my understanding that largely the skull that's been sort of uncovered now um, mimics some of those predictions that the yes. epigenetic process I do remember is representing. This now. Um, and so that's adding a very interesting prior on what lineage that that particular sample could come from. Yeah. Well, so, you know, uh, I know that uh, you don't work particularly in this area, but I mean, I mean, what's going on with, I mean, it just seems like it would be a slam dunk to say that this is Denisovan. Yeah, I mean, it would, but you know, the proof really comes in the pudding, which is DNA analysis. Yeah. Because what we understand as a Denisovan isn't morphological, it's genetic. So we need to make that genetic connection before we you know, really tie in all the pieces together. And I think that's missing, but it's also an opportunity, I think, mm -hmm. to do this kind of analysis. And if ancient DNA fails, perhaps looking at paleoproteomics, uh, which might possibly work, particularly in that climate and at that time range, because we've had success looking at paleoproteomics in much more challenging environments. Well, so, you know, I do, I don't want to forget, uh, you know, this uh, Nesha Ramla hominin, Mm -hmm. um, if it yeah, was absolutely. published at some other time, it would have been like all over the media. Uh -huh. But I feel like when it's called Dragon Man, it kind of went under the <laughs> under the radar. <laughs> well, a I mean, bit. look, you're gonna call, you're calling this the Nesha Ramla hominin uh -huh. versus the Dragon, Dragon Man. Man. We're gonna write about Dragon <laughs> Man, you know. So we're gonna talk about Dragon Man. 
Um, but the National Ram Lahamanin is not is that's not a trivial find. Like this is an old find mm-hmm. before the Emian, before the the interglacial, before our current interglacial. Mm-hmm. And um, it looks to me that what they found is some sort of I don't know, like Neanderthal type individual maybe population and the archaeological finds are uh, the type of archaeological finds that are routinely found in this area at this time so Mm -hmm. this was like a pretty common hominin and one of the conclusions out of this is that well our stem sapiens lineage didn't have any particular advantage when it came to technology during this period vis-a-vis our other cousin b- b- Eurasian hominins. That's, That's really right. – and so what do, you, what do you think about that? Like how do you think you as a genomics person who works with like deep time and then also notices the archaeological stuff, how do you integrate the two together? Because 20 years ago we had a simple story and the simple story was the Upper Paleolithic with an out-of-Africa tribe. You know, I mean Richard Klein at Stanford thought that like other human groups could not speak. Yeah, I mean, you know, we still don't know the answer to that, I think. Yeah. Uh, but sort of, uh, you know, they. I think my prior is that they could, but, yeah. you know, it's still, I, we until we can sort of get soft tissue or something like that, um, I don't think we'll ever maybe get the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in general, I think there needs to be integration of archaeology, uh, genetics, and... Uh, anthropology yeah and we're and i think genetics is the new kid on the block it's led to a lot of puzzles where we have sometimes genetic data that for which we don't have cultural data or anthropological data we have in this case evidence in the or data in the other way where we have some cultural and anthropological information but not genetic information so it's kind of difficult to make sense of everything without all three big pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. And I think Homo Rama is sort of similar, but in perhaps with a little more evidence compared to Homo Longi, but like, you know, it's for me in my brain, it sort of sits in the same vein. Um, that show, like, show me the DNA. You know, show right, me the DNA. <laughs> right, exactly. Or at least show me, you, you know, or, or at some level, show me all three. Um, and I and I think that is sort of where we're moved to eventually in the, in the field. And... I think that'll read to the most robust inferences and maybe it'll make the picture much more complicated because well, I mean, it's already pretty, it's already very complicated. Even anthropologically, it's very complicated. We have many more samples than have existed previously. Um, the picture is no longer simple and, and genetics is just adding an extra layer of complexity where we can see these admixtures almost everywhere. So it doesn't look like a tree anymore. It looks like a graph, a graph, a, graph, a trellis, whatever you want to say. It's, right. it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, so, you know, genetics is the new kid on the block. I mean, there's a little bit of, I don't know, imperial, maybe genetic imperialism is the wrong word because I think, I think a lot of the geneticists are pretty humble as they come into the field uh, about like what – I mean, they're not humble about the insights they can offer. But human evolution, paleoanthropology, I mean, this is like an old and storied – and it's a big deal. That's right. You know, uh, there's a lot of big egos here, so you got to be careful. You know, um, but uh, how do you as a geneticist, when you've interact, interacted and interface with paleo and archaeology people, h- how do you communicate, okay, like I'm really confident in these insights? Because I think sometimes, you know, sometimes like I see exchanges in the in the journals where I don't feel like the archaeologists really understand that, look, I got 525,000 snips. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not a low confidence assertion I'm making here, Mm -hmm. but you know, the other side doesn't really understand the method. Like, I mean, how does that work in terms of this collaboration? I think, you know, by and large, it's gotten a lot better than it had been previously because archeologists and anthropologists are reading genetics papers now simply because it's telling them about their area. Uh, And I I want to make it a point that it's their area in some ways. You know, they've been looking at these things for much longer than geneticists have. And, um, and a second time, in a second sort of uh, point here, I think we're trying to now move into a phase where archaeologists and anthropologists ask the questions uh, in some way or pose hyp- hypotheses that can be then sort of examined with genetics and um, the previously existing archaeological evidence. And we can look at these things together. And, you know, to give a classic example that's associated with this, in, in a paper uh, that I was involved in a couple of years ago, um, Russian archaeologists who, who for a long time and, and continue to 
use morphology to make uh, sort of assessments about sort of genetic or anthropological information about a sample. So um, they look at skeletal morphology or tooth morphology and make classifications about at some level, a genetic relationship that they belong to a particular biological population. And um, so if you look at samples from particular sites in the Bronze Age where such estimates have been made that saying, oh, this sample looks like it's a South Asian, that is of South Asian ancestry, or this sample looks like it's of Northern Eurasian ancestry or something like that. And you try and look at what the genetics is saying, um, there's often very little correspondence. So, mm. um, so that is that morphology has you know, some information, but it doesn't have to be definitive uh, in some way. And we're, they're low on sample size and, and landmarks and the various sort of difficulties that we've come up sort, sort of addressed. Yeah. Um, but with genetics, sort of, we have this very large data size that's sort of independently collected even yeah. within a single sample um, and and has many statistical reasons for why the inferences are, are sort of robust sure. in some way. Yeah, let me uh, let me drill down on this too because I've seen this myself. Uh, in terms of, um, I saw a paper from a couple of years ago uh, and it was an archaeological paper and it was looking at people buried in Roman Britain and it was claiming that these individuals had, like, say, like 10% sub-Saharan African ancestry mm -hmm. based on morphology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know this area super well, but, you know, I just started, like, concluding, like, there's just some power issues, statistical power. Like, you know, how strong and precise of an inference can you make based on these data? That's because right. Because when, 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 when 23andMe returns the results, says you're 10% African, mm -hmm. sub-Saharan African you are you are i mean there's that, like the I interval totally around agree. that is like super tiny but if you're looking at someone's skull and you're just like that's an african skull well, what is that i mean i know what you mean but like there's average differences between the groups but individuals vary so, so much. much exactly and there's so much overlap and also having 200 skulls and making these assumptions is very different from having the dna of those 200 people because each of those samples if they're unrelated represent a whole population of individuals so inferences from from 200 people genetic inference from 200 people is just on an order of magnitude higher in terms of the amount of data it's bringing compared to 200 anatomical uh samples yeah um and and so particularly with your question about roman britain i think uh there's been a lot of debate about the genetic diversity at some level and i'm going to define it as that uh about the people of Roman Britain. And I think the DNA data exists now to sort of make that mm -hmm. statement, like a very quantitative statement sampled over time, not just at the point where Britain was under Roman control, yeah. but thereafter and prior to that period, and look at time transects of a of very large sample size to look at the proportion of sub-Saharan African ancestry yeah. before and after the Roman occupation of Britain. Yeah. And I think it'll be quite evident as to what the proportion of such ancestry is and, you know, what historical questions and claims we can make from that sort of analysis. Yeah, and, you know, I'm not like, you know, I don't want, this isn't like a full-on hate on the caliper people. Like, calipers are important and skull shapes <laughs> are important. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I do find it interesting that um, the people that object to, uh, you know, measuring skulls all of a sudden don't object to measuring skulls in other, are other areas when it supports their ideological priors. So this is how I've, I've known of this sort of stuff because it's just like, wait, you know, this individual is sub-Saharan African, and, and like, in the Pontic Coast? And then That's I'm right. looking at it, I'm just like, um, yeah, I see where you, how you came to that conclusion, but, you know, you're not talking about, like, you know, if you have the power to make that conclusion. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, um, you know, actually, so uh, my friend David Middleman, who was on this podcast before, you know, he's done work in forensic genealogy where he's his lab group has gone and reanalyzed data, partly because, like, with STRs, they couldn't, they couldn't, like, right. discover anything. And so they've gone and reanalyzed data, and there are people who... Based on um, forensics, there was one woman, I think they said she was Japanese. Wow. Based on skull. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and it turned out she's just a white woman. <laughs> right. You know? And so, um, I mean, there's a lot huge variance. Yeah, there's huge variance. I have still have no idea how you could look at someone's skull and say that they're Japanese of all things. That's right. I, I, I actually think you can't make such an inference, but like, 
you know, it's at the time when such data was the only data that was available, people tried to engage in this idea of trying to do this. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right or like not all science works out. Uh, or, you know, we didn't know anything about the variability. And so I think that these were things that were important back in the day. But I think now we have a different tool which can actually tell you uh, what's happening. And so we should use it. Yeah. So, I mean, as we're closing out, like, I guess I want to ask you, like, uh, just a couple of questions about your own perspective as, sure. as a researcher in the field and what you've seen. Um, okay. Like, so brass tacks, like, how far back do you think that we can put push the DNA? I know there's like a 900,000 year old Russian uh, horse That's from right. the Tamir Peninsula, which is as good as it gets. Yeah. Or a, or a mammoth at a million, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you're right. And both of these are sort of perma, almost semi-permafrost yeah, conditions. Like ideal, ideal preservation conditions. So I think, you know, more and more ancient DNA technology is improving. Uh, we're able to isolate DNA that's shorter, much more fragmented, uh, has much fewer proportions of endogenous molecules. We're also dealing with uh, DNA inhibition issues. Um, that is what is DNA inhibition? So that is that when we're generating the DNA libraries to sequence, the, there is contaminants or soil products or, or various other things that are in the environment that the soil was sample was preserved in that right. make it that limits the library preparation process. And we know about this because we can spike in oligonucleotides at a particular concentration mm -hmm. along with the rest of the sample and see what proportion of that that we can recover. Okay. So this analysis is still in its infancy, but, you know, looking at certain samples, say from South Asia, where I've uh, uh, worked on previously, where it's a hot and humid environment and, and a mm -hmm. difficult climate in general to obtain ancient DNA, mm -hmm. uh, there's also, you know, we, we didn't publish on this, but there's sort of speculative evidence that there's also DNA inhibition that's going on, particularly because of the soil environment these samples have been preserved in. Yeah. So I think thinking about those types of issues, uh, you know, also matter. We've now broadly across research groups moved from double-stranded DNA preparation to single-stranded DNA preparation, which in theory should expand uh, the number of molecules that are available to access by fourfold. Okay. And um, so all of these have happened in the past five, yeah. perhaps 10 years. And so and now we have sediment DNA that's recoverable and, and, and so on and so forth. And like, I think that we will continue to see improvements with DNA sequencing technology. And I'm you know, I'm quite hopeful that, like, we'll be able to break the million-year barrier, uh, perhaps for some very well-preserved samples. Mm -hmm. um, or even in some cases, sequence, if they're particularly important, and sequence samples to almost near exhaustion and get DNA data uh, mm -hmm. from, from those samples and, and make some analysis that, that's meaningful. Yeah, well, so let me reiterate for the listener. You know, we have – so you, ha you had the site in Spain that you were talking about that goes to 600,000 years ago or something. Uh -huh. Like, I mean, really ancient. You know, but, you know, our own uh, predominant lineage, overwhelmingly predominant lineage of stem sapiens of modern humans, anatomically modern African humans, uh, we don't have anything in the Pleistocene, right? Like, we don't have anything earlier than the Holocene. That's right. And so it's kind of lame – um, not lame. It's cool that we have all this stuff from the northern Eurasian hominids, but mm -hmm. we know why we got that. It's cold. It's dryish. It's That's isolated. Right. You know. But um, we will, what we would want is like to fill in the phylogeny of our own lineage, but we can't go that far back, right? I mean, that's kind of like the Holy Grail at this point. That's right. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if samples, say, are found in Africa and large parts of Africa are warm and inhumid in or maybe subtropical or tropical that we can't get DNA from there. There are a lot of microclimates, for example, elevation uh, and cave sites. Elevation is known to reduce temperature broadly and cave sites are known to maintain very stable temperatures uh, over a broad range of time. So samples that are preserved in such conditions actually lead yield excellent ancient DNA, even if they're quite old. Mm. Um, and uh, there was a paper from last year releasing six samples from Cameroon yeah. uh, from a stem, from a sort of stem lineage, at least of the Y chromosomal uh, ancestry of modern humans, where the ancient DNA preservation was amazing for the geographical locale that the sample was from. 
So microclimates matter. But in general, a broad scale study of climactic conditions and DNA preservation rates along with the timing of the sample and so on, hasn't been done. And in fact, for as a plug, my group is sort of working on that endeavor at the very moment. Okay, okay. So so, so good things are going to be happening. Um, so, you know, I guess, uh, like, a, like a final question I guess I, got, I, I have is in terms of like, what do you think, I mean, how far do you think our complexity is going to go? Because... It's already at the edge of what, like, <laughs> I can explain to people in, like, I don't know, a thousand words. That's right. You know, I mean, I mean when is this? I mean, it's raining. It's raining lineages. That it is. So I think, you know, we might need to have a new way of articulating these findings. So articulating what admixture means, like, uh, conveying that there's also uncertainty in the proportion of those estimates, like what you refer to as a lineage and what you don't refer to as a lineage. I think for a long time, we've always thought of these things as trees, but even though there never been trees and I don't think anyone assumed that they were trees, like mixture has always been something that's happens in nature and that yeah. we know about it. But I think just for sake of sort of easy understanding or science communication or what, what not, we've sort of told the story as a splits from B and then B splits from C and never the twine shall meet sort of, uh, scenario. But I think maybe now we have an, a chance to tell the story that it is complicated uh, and, you know, try and make, get people excited about that complexity. Yeah. That is, whoa, here there's so many lineages. They're mixing in these complicated ways uh, and representing that in, in the National History Museums or wherever else sort of human evolution is discussed mm -hmm. to the broad public at podcasts like this and sort of really try and articulate that complexity and, and try and do that in a meaningful way. I'm probably not the best person to do this, I don't know, no, no, yeah. but, but there are very good yeah. science communicators out there um, in our field who are doing a great job uh, sort of disseminating, and including you, receive disseminating this information, making it pal palatable in bite-sized packages, yeah. uh, inviting scientists to talk about this and, and sort of reveal well, that complexity. I mean, the story was so, the narrative was so neat and tidy 20 it was. years ago. It, it was. was. Just like, when I you, got into the field, it felt like that. If you just like paused right there. <laughs> it would have been so nice, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, but then you have Denisovans, Neanderthal admixture, all of these other hominins that we don't have DNA for yet, but who knows? Well, the truth is even the experts were surprised. I yeah. mean, that's that's the point about is that, this. So do, do you... You know, like I've talked to uh, I talked to David about this and he and Nick and they both say that they were surprised. But other people claim, well, we always knew. Well, you know, I think it's there's impossible to know that there's something called a Denisovan. Yeah. Because, you know, th there was never any DNA for something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, one can always make a claim that, oh, look, there has likely to have been mixture or there possibly was mixture. Yeah. From one ancient hominin group that separated from what we call stem humans or what yeah. we call in the podcast stem humans from and, and then later mixed into those ages. Yeah. But at some level, anyone can make those claims. Like you either make a claim that says, oh, there is no mixture or you make a claim that there has been mixture. Yeah. And you can make a claim that there's been a lot of mixture or make a claim that there's been very little mixture. But like that's not how science proceeds. So anyone who says they already knew or like they didn't know. Or their priors were. You know, yeah, I, their priors were X or Y. He's just making a guess. Yeah. You know, it's like saying who's going to win the next tennis tournament. Well, uh, nobody will know until you find get the data. Yeah, and I'll say that, you know, ancient DNA has been so revolutionary as far as like, you know, Jeff, Jeff Wall and Mike Hammer, they were talking about, you know, admixture from other lineages, from Neanderthals and stuff in 2006. You look at their paper and nobody cites it. That's right. And, you know, I would love to see people who make such claims show based on anthropological evidence that they are seeing some of these signals like that is what they're using as a basis for their prior mm -hmm. so if someone says look there's neanderthal admixture into modern humans or made that claim in the 1990s or something like that before the dna was sequenced what can they point to that they've published on mm -hmm. that suggests based on anthropological evidence or any evidence whatsoever that such admixture has been possible Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is a real proof of the pudding. So when someone makes a statement saying that, oh, look, we I, I've talked about this. I mentioned this in my things. What evidence are they also quoting mm -hmm. to make such a statement? And I'd like to see that, actually. Well, um, also, you know, I, I guess like, you know, as we're closing out, I, I do think one thing that I've been saying uh, is that um, we're going to 
Africa is going to be the 2020s to understand this stuff. Yep. Um, I feel like we kind of have the, the Eurasian story is complicated with the admixture, but look, we're all all Eura- all Eurasians and Australasians and Amerindians. We all <laughs> descend from yeah that sixty thousand year old you know pulse. Okay, so we got that. That's a simple. But within Africa, I feel like the models there's alternative models where it's like they're all. There's some alternative models that are, you can't distinguish which one is right. That's we right. don't have the ancient DNA. And so when people like ask me for I don't I'm, I just say I don't have a definitive answer. I don't think we know what's going on there. Mm-hmm. You know? I totally agree with you. I think, you know, that's the next 10 years or maybe 20 years of research is going to be Africa, but also maybe parts of the Near East and so on. Mm-hmm. Um as we'll make more discoveries And I think, you know, these discoveries sort of, for me, the joy has been sort of reading discoveries that go one after another, where the DNA sort of produces some new discovery that's sort of spectacular. And then the paleoanthropologists sort of one-up us with like their own spectacular discovery about some new sample. And at some le- at some time in the future, these two analyses are going to meet. Yeah, uh, because because the truth is out there. Exactly. That's- and so I, I just think that it's a very, very exciting time to be thinking about human evolution. We have all the tools necessary. Uh, even archaeology is moving into a revolution on like what sites should be sampled and so on. We have so much data and... It's just going to be a brave new world with coming into this sort well, of may- field. Maybe, maybe don't say brave new world. Fair. <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe don't. I'm just saying, geneticists are not really good marketers. <laughs> so, All fair. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it's it's gonna it's an interesting new world. Fair. An interesting new world. Fair. Okay. Well, um, thank you for talking uh, to me. Um, I just. You know, I could I, I could do like a monologue about this, I think, but it's really great to have this dialogue because I feel like, you know, we have our different opinions, but also we know the same methods. We know the same literature. That's right. And we're not Bones people. Neither of us are pretending to be Bones people, but I can't pretend to be a Bones person. Neither can I. You know, but like I think we can both look at the evidence sort of sub- objectively and sort of try and understand like what inferences are being made and whether they sort of support or validate what genetics also has to say. Yeah. That we both understand really well, I think. And, you know, really try and see what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, which uh, there's going to be a lot that's happening in the future. All right. So thank you for your time, thank uh, you, Vagish. Yep, and, thank you. Um, you know, hopefully we'll talk some other time. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me again. This podcast for kids.